Welcome to the wonderful world of wine, exploring all things wine with you. We are your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay, and you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the wonderful world of wine, exploring trending topics in the wine world and speaking to interesting people from all corners of the wine industry. I am your host, Kim Simone. I am here with my co-host, Mark Lenzi. How are you today, Mark? Everything is great, Kim. Happy fall. Cool. Yeah. Right? Happy fall indeed. It's uh, starting to get a little chillier, maybe. The leaves are changing color. We have a special guest with us today with some local connections, but wines that people will surely recognize from their wine store shelves. We are very pleased to be joined today by Joseph Carr. How are you today, Joseph? I'm fantastic. And it's Indian summer. It's not mm -hmm. fall, winter. Right. It's like that chart where it's like false spring, false fall, yes. <laughs> false winter. <Yeah. laughs> there are, there are not four on, seasons uh, here in New uh, England. We've got like 27. Welcome to the show, Joseph. It's a pleasure to have you. And for our listeners out there, I'm sure there's not one that has not tasted or seen your wine on the shelf. So this is exciting to have you on the show today. Well, thank you very much. So I wanted to jump right into the wines because it's not often that we get to talk to someone whose actual name is on the label of the wine bottle that, that we see in front of us. But you have a number of different or had a number of different wine labels out there in the world that were of your creation or of your brand. So I was hoping that you could give our listeners just a little bit of a rundown of how you started in the wine industry, how you got here and about those wines and about those wine labels? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been on a very interesting journey, you might say. I'm not from California. I'm actually from upstate New York. And I grew up right on the Massachusetts border near Williamstown, Massachusetts. And my father was a lumberjack. And I grew up in a lumber mill town where there wasn't a lot of white wine. <laughs> I, I think the favorite wine in town was called Genesee Cream Ale. And I, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I drank a bunch of that in my time in uh, in college in upstate New York. Yeah, so you, you understand. But uh, I was, you know, I, I, I've had this interesting journey, interesting career. I wound up uh, going to college in uh, upstate New York, near the Finger Lakes of all places, a place called Geneseo, uh, New York, outside of Rochester, New York. Got there and I had spent the summer before hitchhiking across the country. You know, it was 1978, and I had long hair, and I had a sign, and, and I hitchhiked to California, and I carried Kerouac's book On the Road, and um, Travels with Charlie by Steinbeck, and I, I brought a journal with me, and because I wanted to see America. I'd never really been outside of this little town that I grew up in, and I wound up in Napa Valley by a lark. You know, I was in San Francisco, and, and somebody said, hey, Joe, you should go check out Napa Valley. There's wineries up there. And I'm like, what's a winery? I, I didn't know really anything about wine. You know, my father grew up on a farm so, and all my uncles lived on farms. So I, I understood farming, but I didn't know anything about grapes or anything like that. So I thought, so, okay, well, I, you know, I hitchhiked up there and, you know, in 1978, Napa Valley was not what it is today. You know, today it's million dollar estates and international wineries and public companies and people that have uh, art collections and, you know, fancy cars and there's fancy restaurants everywhere. But in 1978, it was really pretty sparse and it was populated by a lot of people that I think today might be just dismissed as immigrants. But they were families from places like France and Spain and Italy that had come to this part of the country, part of the world, to capture the American dream. And they brought their culture with them. Food, culinary, agriculture, winemaking, and all of that. It was kind of very much an international place to be. And there were a lot of hippies and retired people starting wineries. I wound up there and there I was on a porch one afternoon and, you know, looking kind of skinny and hungry. And this family kind of took me in and said, why don't you have a glass of this? And it was called Cabernet Sauvignon. And I tasted it and I was like, wow, 
<laughs> this is not Genesee cream ale. <laughs> this is something. This is crazy. This is wild. And uh, I fell in love with that place. And then I hitchhiked home, and my old man put me in his pickup truck and took me to this place called Genesee, Jersey, where um, I was supposed to be the captain of the wrestling team and and uh, be a phys ed major and all that. And they dropped the wrestling team and they dropped the phys ed program. And you're probably wondering, how, what does this have to do with wine? Well, I'm about to get there. I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to study art, but I couldn't ask my father to pay for that. And I walked into town and there was this French restaurant called the Big Tree Inn. And I looked inside and there were people wearing tuxedos serving food and wine by candlelight. And I thought it was the coolest thing thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I had worked in a lumber mill. I worked in the woods. You know, I picked roses. I picked corn. I worked on farms. I was blue collar as you could possibly get. And I looked at this restaurant and I said, this is what I want to do. I want to do this. So I uh, <laughs> got my hair cut. I had really long hair. And I got my hair cut and I walked in. And I went up to the owner and I said, listen, I've worked at all these great French restaurants in my hometown, Berlin, New York, and I really could use a job. And it was a little bit of a fib, you might say, because there weren't any French restaurants in my hometown. And I, I had never even eaten in a French restaurant. And uh, I think they felt sorry for me. And they made me a busboy. And I didn't really want to be a busboy. I wanted to be a waiter because the waiters wore tuxedos. In 1977, I wore a lime green tuxedo to my prom. And I thought I looked pretty good in a tuxedo. And that's what I really wanted. But they made me a busboy. And, and uh, nonetheless, a couple of weeks went by. And, and they said, hey, Joe, listen, you're the worst busboy we've ever hired. You're, you're terrible. <laughs> oh, no. I, I didn't know what I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I was you know, I was just trying to get a job and trying to pay for school. And uh, the owner's wife said to the husband, said, listen, this kid, he shows up all the time. You know, he shows up on time. He works really hard. You know, I had this blue collar work ethic that my dad, whose nickname was Josh. And I'll get to that later because that's the money point. You know, we got to do something for him. And Fred, the owner, said, oh, man. All right. So he gives me a, a tie bow tie and an empty bottle of wine and a corkscrew. And he gives me the Signet Guide to Wine, which is a book about two inches, three inches thick. And he says, OK, Joe, you go home, you uh, come back. And if you can tie the bow tie and you can open the bottle of wine and you can tell me everything that's in this book, I'll give you a job. And he walks away thinking, OK, I I'm giving the kid a shot, but he's he's never going to come back. Yeah, that's not intimidating at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I knew how to tie the bow tie. I went to Methodist Sunday school. You know, I, I knew how to tie a bow tie. I didn't know how to open a bottle of wine, but, you know, I, I had, you know, I had a couple of days to figure that out. But then I went back to my dorm and I read this book. And you'll understand this. You read this book and it takes you to places like Bordeaux and Burgundy and the Loire Valley. And then, and then it takes you to Tuscan and Piemonte. And then you take a, a left turn and all of a sudden you're in Spain, in Rioja. And then you go back, you're in the Moselle Valley of Germany. And then you're back in Napa Valley. And that book was a window. That book was a window to places and things and people that I could never imagine I would ever be part of or see or anything. And I just, I thought it was fascinating. So I went to work on Monday and, and Fred looks at me, he goes, what are you doing here? I go, well, <laughs> he said, I've tied the bow tie, as you can see, and I can open the bottle of wine. And I read the book. And he goes, you read that book? I go, yes, I did. I read that book. You should did, huh? He goes, well, tell me three crews of Beaujolais, which, you know, it's a quick question because back then there were nine. Now there are 10. But I uh, I looked at him. And I said, Morgan, Fleuret, and Moulin Vin. And he's like, oh, man, I guess I got to give you a job. <laughs> Like, oh, uh -huh. no, the kid read the book. <laughs> he read the book. He read the book. And he gave me a job. I, I became a captain, uh, uh, like a waiter captain, and then a wine steward. And then I went on to become a sommelier. Uh, I left college and became a sommelier for the Hyatt Regency Hotels down in Tampa, Florida. And um, I worked as a psalm for 10 years. I came home from college, and I said to my dad, hey, Dad, guess what? I'm a sommelier. <laughs> he said, hey, don't talk like that in front of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He had no idea what I was doing. And and then I told him, and he's like, you're telling me that people actually pay you to taste wine and tell them what you think about it? I go, yeah. He goes, America is the greatest country in the world. (laughs) And that's kind of how I got into the beginnings of the wine business. And I did that for 10 years. And then I got a job uh, working for a, a national import company as a sales and marketing guy. And my first job was to go to Italy, to Piemonte. And my father put me on the plane that day. And I was like, wow, this is great. This is like amazing. I worked for Santa Margherita. I worked for Fresco Baldi. I worked for Pio Cesare and, and a whole bunch of suppliers in Italy and, and France, Spain, Greece, and Napa Valley. And unfortunately, my, my father passed away not too long after after I started that. So I never really saw the next chapter in my career. But I worked for wineries all over the world in marketing and became an executive for, for 10 years. And I wound up becoming president of a, of a company called Mildara Blass, which was a, a subsidiary of the Foster's Brewing Group. And I, I wound up becoming president of that company when I was 39 years old. I was the youngest and only American to ever, ever run that company here in North America. And then eventually I that merged into Behringer. And I, was, I was vice president of Behringer. So that's a lot of oxygen before I even started my own company. Do you, do you have any questions before yeah. I go into the next little chapter? No, I didn't. I didn't realize half of what you your story. It's it's amazing. It really is. Yeah, yeah. it's a crazy crazy journey. I love hearing everybody's sort of origin story about how they got into wine because we say it time and time again, there is no straight line (laughs) in either being or getting into this industry. And we all have such different stories and nobody has the same path. And I think that that's one of the really wonderful things about our industry is that everyone has kind of come at it from a different place a different background, brings different perspectives. And I'm really glad that we got to hear yours. How many years was it, Joseph, from the time you drank a a beer to becoming a sommelier? Was it like less than 10 years? Well, yeah. Well, I was drinking beer when I was 17 and I was 18. I I was working in a French restaurant. I'm from upstate New York. My drinking age was 18. And then I became a sommelier when I was 20, um, I was 20, 21. Wow, pretty anyway, fast. Yeah, no, that's a, a really, really early start to the industry. Good for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, nobody did this. And I was really young. I like to read a lot. Have you been any sommeliers? I mean, they're kind of geeky. I call them geeky yeah. butlers. That, that's what I was <laughs> myself butler i mean i knew a little bit about a lot of stuff and not a lot about a little stuff so and i was there to serve people wine and tell them a little bit about it if they wanted to know about it if they didn't want to know about it i kind of didn't interject myself into the conversation but i i, I had a wonderful job i mean gosh i go to work at three o'clock in the afternoon taste wine for a couple hours with suppliers and distributors and then open up the restaurants and do a class on wine with my wine steward. We'd have four or five restaurants. And when I was a sommelier wine director at the Sagamore Hotel Wine Spectator Award, which I won a couple of times, work until nine, 10 o'clock and then chef makes you something to eat have a bottle of wine. It's not a bad, I should have stuck with it. But then I decided I had higher aspirations. So here I am, I'm, I'm president of this company, Mildara Blass, and, and then vice president of Behringer. And it was a very corporate world, publicly traded company, amazing winemakers, Aaron Pot. I worked with so many amazing guys, John Glazer from Wolf Blass. Mm-hmm. You know, that was an amazing part of the journey is to meet those people that were so inspired and so dedicated. And wines that were made from lots of different regions. You know, California is California. You've got Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, and and very sophisticated wines from all those places. But then you have the wines from Greece and the wines from Spain, the wines from Italy and France. They're all very, very, very different. And their stories are very different. And I, I really enjoyed working with them. And Australia was where I spent a lot of time because I was running uh, Mildara Blast. And their, their big brand was Wolf Blast, which is, was an international brand. And I also, at the time, created Greg Norman Estates Wines. I worked with uh, the golfer, Greg Norman, who was actually a very nice man. And his daughter went to Boston College. 
uh, Morgan. And that was very creative. That was great to work with him and do those things. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I was doing very well. I had a very successful career and we all have pivots in our life. And my pivot was I was doing very well, making really good money, doing all kinds of really great things. And I was miserable. I was never home. We lived in Cape Cod. I never lived in California. My wife and daughter, my daughter grew up in upstate New York. and We lived in upstate New York and we moved to Cape Cod. And my wife did not want to move to California. So we made a decision that we would live this life where I would travel a lot and then I'd come back. That got old and tired. And I missed a couple of things. I missed my daughter's prom and I missed some cross country runs and I, and I missed one anniversary. And that was it for me. I was like, wait a minute, what am I doing? I mean, I love the wine business, but it's a sacrifice. So I needed to kind of think about the next step in my life. And I did. I was, I was actually on a plane ride coming back from Melbourne to, uh, to LA to New York. And I had this crazy idea just like a crazy, crazy idea. And um, I had a good idea, but I lacked two things. And those two things were courage and conviction. Because if you're going to start a company or, or if you're going to do something where you're going to go all in, you need to have those two things. And I didn't have them. But then one Tuesday, I was sitting here in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and my wife was in uh, upstate New York, and my daughter was a freshman in college. And my wife calls me and says, you need to turn on the TV right now. And I turn it on, and, and the plane had just hit the first tower. And then a few minutes later, the plane hit the second tower. My friend's wife was on the first plane. I had four friends that were in the second tower. I had five employees in New York City that I could not find for two days. And that moment changed everyone's life in the world, but it changed my life a lot because I woke up and said, if I have a dream, I have to like go after it now. I can't wait any longer. I, I want to change my life. And I came home and sat down with Dee and we talked about the next chapter in our life. And um, a few weeks later, I resigned my job and refinanced my house. And I started a little negociant firm making wine in Napa Valley, California. And it took two years to produce my first product. And I worked inside Fremark Abbey Winery. Ted Edwards was a winemaker there. I went out and said, listen, I, I want to make wine in Napa Valley. I think I know how to do it. I want to make it in a Bordeaux style. I'm going to be a classic French negociant. I will buy grapes. I will contact growers and I'll work inside your winery, which is what negociants do. Now all the really cool winemakers in Napa Valley, that, that's how they do it. They, they're, they're all negociants. None of them can afford a $10 million winery or, or any of that stuff. But back then, people were like, ah, no, who does that? I said, well, I can do it. Mm -hmm. it. That's how the Joseph Carr brand, that was the genesis of Joseph Carr, Napa Valley. And then later, a few years later, I created Josh Sellers. Wow. So what that's an amazing kind of story. How, Jeez. Uh, well, you, you lay awake at night. <laughs> you know, oh, when I, I told my wife we're going to refinance our house, man, you should have, the, you know, <laughs> the, the, the wall, the paint almost came off the wall. The, <laughs> I heard words that I'd only heard from sailors. You know, it was, <laughs> this, this was tough, but wow. I believed in it. Like I knew winemakers and I knew growers and I knew the process. I'm not a winemaker. I'm a producer, and, and I always try to emphasize that. Like, Don't call me a winemaker, because I'm not. I, I work with Aaron Pott and Ted Edwards and Tom Larson and Catherine Craig and, and all these great, great winemakers in Napa Valley, and I just tell them what my vision is and where we want to source it from, and that's the process. And that, and that was the process. I want to give a shout out to Ruby Wines. You guys know Ruby Wines and Ted yep. Rubin, who was one of the owners, and Brad and, his, and Ted's brother, Bob. When I started my company and brought them what I, they were the first people in America that believed in me and took a chance on me. And, and had they not, I probably wouldn't be around had it not been for the Rubin family. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it. And I don't know why they believed in me. I know I had a long talk with Ted one day, and Ted knew a lot about wine. And he said, you're, you're doing something different, and we like it. We like it a lot. Then I wound up in New York and Ohio and Florida and all these other places, but all really started in Massachusetts and, and upstate New York. It's so, so funny you, you said that, Joseph, because just today I met a gentleman from Bordeaux who said the exact same thing about Ruby and their support and that family. So I, I think that's amazing that you had the same experience. It's good to hear oh, yeah. that this wholesalers like that out there. <laughs> 
Well, you know, they're a family-owned company. I deal with a lot of big companies now. You have no idea. The door got closed in my face so many times when I started out. And I would do anything. Like, honestly, I'm not going to call out other stores, but, you know, there were some stores that would say, okay, we'll buy some wine if you come to a tasting. And I lived hours away and, and I would show up. I'd show up and I'd stand by, stand there on a Saturday afternoon. and I would do whatever it took because for us, failure was not an option. So one day uh, I get this phone call. You know, I'm making Cabernet Sauvignon, but I'm making it in a, in a Bordeaux-style blend. Uh, I'm blending Cabernet Sauvignon with Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Verdot. I do the percentages so I can still call it Cabernet Sauvignon, which, which um, you know, the, the legal side of it, it's got to be 85% uh, or 95%. Uh, back then it was 85% Cabernet to be called Cabernet. So I was skating the line a little bit. Let's just say... <clears throat> There was 85% cabin. Let's let's just say that. For official sake, there certainly was 85%. But again, I'm I'm making these wines. We're producing these wines in a Bordeaux style. And I get this phone call from this guy. And you know, I'm sending my wines everywhere. And this gentleman was from New York. He was from New York City. And I, I was in New York City at just a couple little stores, mostly restaurants. I tried to just go to restaurants because I was a sommelier. I could talk to them. I could tell them a little bit about it and they would be accepting. So I get this phone call and this guy's talking to me and talking to me. He's asking me all these questions like, why are you doing this? Why are you making it this way? Why aren't you doing these big, you know, Robert Parker style, big Cabernet Sauvignons, high in, you know, high in alcohol, high tannin. And I'm like, that's not really what I like. I, I like Bordeaux. I like something that's a little more balanced and also approachable. And, you know, I mean, you know, Premier Cru, Grand Cru Bordeaux, I mean, they take time, but but other Bordeaux, they come along, you know, much sooner. And that's what I wanted to make. I wanted to make wines that would go well with food. And we had this great conversation. It was really good. And then I, I got done and, and he said, um, well, thank you. It's nice to talk to you. My name's Eric Asimov. I'm like, Eric Asimov. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Name sounds familiar. I go, like, I wasn't thinking. I go, are you any relationship to Isaac Asimov, the the, the (laughs) fiction writer? He goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, he's my dad. And then I'm like, oh, okay, thanks. (laughs) And then I'm like, yeah. I know. And then a month later, the New York Times comes out with this article about producers to watch. And they named all these great producers. And and my name was one of them. Mm. Wow. I can't believe this. You got to be kidding. Wow. And uh, that skyrocketed everything. That skyrocketed everything. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. Today, we have a special guest, Joseph Carr of Josh Wines. You can find more information about him and this story on joshsellers.com. You can also find on Instagram at joshsellers. If you want more information about Kim, you can go to her website, commonwealthwineschool.com. For more information about myself, you can go to franklinliquors.com. Our program is supported by Franklin Public Radio. You can find all our past episodes on SoundCloud and iTunes. We're back with Joseph Carr. And Joseph, I have to tell you right now, we've done a lot of shows, interviewed a lot of people, and we've never not interrupted anyone from a story because Kim and I are all about telling the story. And I think this is an amazing story about how you started to how you've gotten to one of the most popular wines in the United States. You mentioned your dad, and I'm sorry, I read the story about you losing your wife. I'm very sorry about your loss. And you mentioned her briefly, how your struggles and getting yelled at when you made the big change. How did they both influence you in your wine decisions? I know you named the wine after your dad. Doesn't sound like he was a wine drinker. And did your wife help you create the brand as well? Well, you want to hear about the birth of Josh? Yes. So here's the birth of Josh. I am now had this accolade in the New York Times. I am doing great. I'm doing awesome. I'm everywhere. Ruby Wines is so happy. And I'm in New York and I'm all these places. And guess what? The 2007 vintage comes along and the price of grapes double. Wow. Double. And I'm a success. I can't raise my prices and then i have one of my biggest distributors go bankrupt and i am in a world of poop 
And I'm sitting there going, I'm in trouble. I'm in, I'm successful and, and I might lose my whole company. So I went out to California to meet this guy named Tom Larson. And Tom Larson was a grower, vineyard manager, and winemaker. And we sat in his kitchen. Here's where it gets good. We sat in his kitchen and we had a bottle of wine. I was telling him how much trouble I was in. And uh, we had a bottle of wine and then we had a second bottle of wine. And then we were into our third bottle of wine. And he's like, I got a great idea. <laughs> you got to make wine outside of Napa Valley, bro. You got to do something that'll be good, but you got to find something else. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea, Tom. How am I going to do that? He goes, I'll help you. I know a vineyard that uh, Andy Beckstopper owns up in the North Coast. We, we can get this. We can make a great wine at a great price. He goes, so go, just go get some money. I'm like, get some money? What are you talking about? Where? What am I going to go? Go to the money tree in my backyard and shake it? Hmm. So I went home and I, I found an envelope that had my 401k that said $70,450.20. I cashed that in. Oh, boy. And my wife said, oh, he's gone. He's gone off the reservation. He's We've lost him. He's, he's done. <laughs> and I went back and we made this wine. And I didn't have any marketing plan. I didn't have any brand. I didn't have anything because I didn't know whether the wine had to be good. It had to match what I you know expected it to be. And we tasted in barrel and I said, Tom, this is really good. I really like this. So now I got to come up with a, a brand. And I uh, you know, the night that we hung out drinking wine, we talked about our dads and both of our fathers had passed away around the same time. We and we laughed and we cried and we told stories. And I thought, that's really what this is all about. I was talking to my mom about it. And I was like, I don't know what to do. And she goes, well, just name it after your dad. I'm like, well, my dad's name was Joseph Carr. <laughs> she goes, no, 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 your dad's name is Josh. I'm like, what? Excuse me? What are you talking about? Just yeah, you know, your dad's name was Josh. And I'm I'm looking at my sister going, what is she talking about? <laughs> She goes, yeah, yeah, I know that. I'm like, what do you know? Who the hell is Josh? <laughs> and my mom's like, calm down. That was your dad's nickname. He used to race stock cars in Lebanon Valley, New York, and Vermont, and Massachusetts. And when he raced stock cars, all of his buddies called him Josh. That was his nickname. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I never heard that before. I go, I never heard anyone in our house call my father Josh. And my mom's like, yeah, that's right. Because anybody that called your father Josh, Josh wasn't allowed in our house. They were a bunch of just punks. You know, they were <laughs> picky race car guys. And my mom wrote his name down, wrote Josh down on a piece of paper. My mom had this wonderful uh, handwriting and calligraphy. And that's the label. That's the label that you see today. Oh, wow. So it's your dad's name and your mom's handwriting. Yeah, my mom's handwriting. That's so cool. And I'm like, okay, well, I've got this wine that I think is really good. And there's a story behind it that's real. And I took it out. I got to talk about my dad because, you know, he had died so many years ago. And I, I got to tell funny stories about my father and all his friends and say, look at this wine. This wine is, is a value. It's a really great wine for the money. And that's what I wanted. I wanted everyone to afford it. I didn't want to just make wine for one percenters or 10 percenters. I wanted something that, that everyone could enjoy. And that's the story of Josh Sellers. That's how it, that was the genesis. Amazing. And I sold it out of my truck. I used to drive around in this old Discovery Land Rover that I had. And I'd go to every store that I could and say, just, you know, just give me a chance and, and um, try it. And then three or four years into it, all of a sudden, it just just went nuts. Imagine this perspective. The first year I made a thousand cases of wine. This year, Josh Sellers will be seven million cases. Wow. It's the number one premium selling brand in the United States. Number one cab, number one, two Chardonnay, the rosés in the top I want to say the top 10. We make Prosecco now in Italy. I mean, it's something that is so incredibly hard to imagine or believe. And I certainly couldn't imagine it. I never imagined it would be that. Never. But it blew up and went crazy. And I think people appreciate authenticity. And then when you get a chance to partner with the Deutsch family, 
who came along, gosh, 11 years ago and said, we believe in you and we can take your vision to another place. And, you know, Bill and Peter Deutsch and Tom Stefanski just stood up and, and believed in me, like, you know, like the Rubin families did and, and many other distributors throughout the country. But, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy journey. You know, we got wine enthusiasts, American Winery of the Year two years ago. I stood up there just shaking my head going, wow. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So is Josh Sellers the only brand at the moment that you are responsible for that's under kind of your management or well, no, no, umbrella? All, no, no. Everything's everything's managed by the Deutsch family now. Okay. They, they took over the reins of all that. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, my wife got sick and passed away. And uh, at the time we were in the middle of saying, OK, what's the succession plan? The Deutsch family came along and, and presented a, a proposition that, that made a lot of sense. And we went along with that. And then D, who was a co, D was a co-founder. D, D, you know, D was the accountant. <laughs> D was the one that counted the money or lack yeah. of money, which he <laughs> used to say, "We don't have any money." <laughs> what do you mean you want to make? What do you mean you want to make Pinot Noir? How are we going to do that? <laughs> Listen, did you read the? Did you see the movie Sideways? We we just got to make some Pinot Noir. Yeah. It'll sell. So then what happened was uh, about a year after she passed away, I had done a television commercial and, and some social media stuff with Deutsch. They called me up and, and I would really walked away. You know, I, I, I just walked away from everything. He was diagnosed with, with brain cancer and treated Dana Farber and passed away in 14 months. And I was I thought I was done. I really was like, I'm, I'm done. I got some money. I'm done. And uh, they call me up and they say, Joe, you know anything about this television commercial? I go, no, not really. They're like, well, you, you got 150 million views on YouTube. So <laughs> well, you uh, like it or not, you're bigger than Bartles and Graves or whatever that company was. Or You're an internet sensation. And uh, I was like, wow. And they said, come back. Come back and, and do charity work and do public speaking and, and do some social media and, and thought, yeah, why not? It's another chapter in my life. And, and that's what I do now. That. Money for cancer and education and first responders. And that was the foundations of Josh Sellers is to always have some philanthropic you know, cornerstone. And, and the Deutsches have been wonderful. And Ruby Wines has, has been wonderful in, in partnering with so, so many things, you know, donating wine to big events, especially here in Boston and, and the Cape. Congratulations. We saw you uh, recognized by Massachusetts Governor Healy for your contributions to the arts. It's an amazing accomplishment. And you mentioned earlier about American Winery of the Year, correct? Is that what it was? Wine, American yeah. Winery yeah. by Wine Enthusiast. When you hear like the recognition of your philanthropy versus your awards for your wine, what are you most proud of? The wine awards or your individual awards? Um. Well, philanthropy, <laughs> that's a fancy word. And where <laughs> I grew up, Philanthropy was a bake sale, if you know what I mean. Like yeah. we grew up, I don't want to say I grew up poor, but I, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, and I grew up in a blue collar place. So the only philanthropy out there was like, okay, on Sunday we're gonna have a bake sale, and we're gonna uh, raise money for the church or for the wrestling team or or for the choir or for the band, and and that's where I learned about philanthropy, and, and I'm very proud to have extended that and had the opportunity to be part of foundations and causes that Josh Sellers is allowed me to be a part of. So that, that's important. You know, wine recognition, yes, that's amazing. I mean, it's a big world. It's a big competitive place. I never really paid too much attention to scores or awards. I just really wanted to produce wine that people would like, you know, that people would have as part of their lives. When social media came out, my wife <laughs> my wife would sit around the, the, the supper table and uh, we'd look at Facebook posts about people sharing our wines at events like weddings. They, they, they chose Josh Sellers for their wedding. Or this one girl sent us a post like, oh, I just met this guy and he brought me a bottle of Josh Sellers and and now that's our wine. You know, that that's our wine. Yeah. Imagine well, what you would have said of- when you, you were on Saturday Night Live, all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yeah, you know, I know the producer of Saturday Night Live. He called me in the afternoon and said, you better watch tonight because it's going to get crazy. We had had 100 million comments on X two weeks 
earlier for a Josh meme and they kind of picked it up and um, I knew a couple of guys from Saturday Night Live and they they called me and said and they did that great sketch with Dakota Johnson and I was like wow yeah <laughs> it was great and, and you know the whole industry looked at that and they're like how do we get that we didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. pre-advertise that's just <laughs> that just became a cultural thing which Josh Sellers has become a, a cultural a fabric of people's lives and uh it, we, it gets shared with us all the time and you know some of the comments are, are aren't very complimentary but but we don't, I don't really care, you know, at least they're talking about us. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's been a crazy. Well, you're just hearing, you, you're hearing a lot of the consumer feedback, but as a retailer, I can tell you what Josh Wines has done for retail is amazing. And I thank you for that because with the pending dropping of wine sales, or whatever, Josh has always been consistent and a go to for people in retail. So I want to thank you for that as a retailer. The wine category is down uh, all across the board, but Josh sells is actually still in the high single, almost double digit growth, which is um, to me remarkable. And I think a lot of that, we, we, we kind of figured it out is we do so much social media content. We do these commercials that and social media that gets all kinds of exposure and they're all legitimate, authentic pieces because a, a lot of them are involve me where I'm just, just talking about the journey that I'm on. And I think a lot of people appreciate that and and um, you're just trying to stay true to form. Listening to you talk about the journey and the story, and Mark and I seem to always come back to this sort of story behind the wine or story behind the label, and every wine and every winery seems to have something unique about it, and I kind of was going into this interview tonight thinking, oh my goodness, such a big brand, everybody knows about it. How is he possibly going to make this (laughs) personal and give us a story, and you absolutely did that and really shines a light that even on something that has so much recognition and however many millions of cases would you say seven million close to that i think you said that there is still this personal touch behind it with the story relating to your parents and your family and your upbringing and everything and I think it's nice to see this side of it as well, because often we'll talk to these little itty bitty producers. But for someone who has one of these big brands that we also talk about, because frankly, it's very important to the wine industry to have these wines that people recognize and that they love, not just important for that, I think, comfort factor of having a favorite bottle of wine, but also to get people into drinking wine in the first place. And I think that your wines really do do that. They both have that familiarity to them and that comfort factor, but also they're pretty darn tasty. So it <laughs> kind of hits all the, the parts. And I'm proud to say that I was in that first group of Ruby salespeople way back in like 2006 <laughs> to be selling your wines. I was uh, oh, wow. as part of the team back then. So yeah, wow. we, uh, we loved them when you first came into Ruby. So I was out the other day and I met some, some young, younger people and, um, they recognize me from the from the uh, YouTube stuff. Uh, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, the woman said, "You're Josh guy, right?" I go, "Yeah." She goes, "I have three of you in my house right now." <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> three of you in my refrigerator. Three of you. And you're my, my friend. And my one friend is aggressively dating you on Fridays. She tells people that I'm <laughs> hanging out with Josh. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up it's so yeah. it's so innocent and so nice and that is so, really cute um you know so amazing and uh but it's a big brand but it's a personal journey yeah and it will always be a personal journey and i can't thank you enough for having me on and, and allowing me to tell that story oh joseph thank you very much and i, yeah. I hope our listeners appreciate that story because it's it was amazing i learned so much more i was telling kim a while ago that i remember reading your story somewhere i could never find where it was just amazing and i'm glad you got to tell our listeners today about it thank you so much we were always so used to you know these winemakers coming from california and you would uh stand up there on a friday morning in front of the sales force and you're like yeah i live on the cape <laughs> we're yeah. like oh a local yeah. he's one of us <laughs> Yeah, I'm right down the street. I was just on WBZ television a couple of weeks ago, and I said, well, I've been producing wine in Napa Valley for 20 years, but I live on the Cape, and it's mm-hmm. a really, really long commute. Yep. <laughs> yep. yep, so you're a local. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Well, thank you for coming on the show.
Thank you for listening to us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Mark Lenzi and Kim Simone. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. We are supported by Franklin Public Radio. Our guest today has been Joseph Carr. You can find more information about him and his wines at joshsellers.com. Find all of his Instagram posts at at Josh Sellers. And we hope to see you for our next show. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.